Welcome on center stage. Thank yeah, you for joining me. Make yourself like feel at home. Yeah, I was almost disappointed. This is the orange room. There's a whole blue room. I'm like, oh my god, Booking.com should have been in the blue room. But is hey, that, ho, is huh? that so a brand mismatch? It's a brand mismatch. But okay, <laughs> I can live with it. <laughs> but so, uh, you know, where uh, where are you based? You're based in Amsterdam. Uh, in Amsterdam, Orange. I agree. Orange. So, you know. so uh, I saw that you studied in the Netherlands. I so, did. Yeah. yeah, I love the Netherlands. But you know why the most? For the bitter ballon. Bitter ballon. Yes, exactly. But we're not here to talk about bitter yeah. ballon, so I'm not going to bore you about that. But thank you again for being here and for everyone that's just tuning in now. Um, Arjen Dijk, Senior Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer at Booking.com. And thank you for this very refreshing and concise briefing. I'm always amazed how much information you can convey in little time. So, um, yeah, there's a lot I want to touch upon, but you mentioned a few key trends, right? So we know what you say is important, what's driving uh, marketing, but maybe we um, can go a bit on the general overview of the market. Yeah. Um, there has been a lot of talk about revenge travel, right? Yeah. Would you say that's still a thing and what are you seeing in consumer trends and behavior? Yeah, so the interesting thing during the pandemic, and many of us have, have lived that through, you saw big shifts in travel behavior. Huh? And, um, and one of the big shifts was, you know, a focus on domestic a focus on vacation rentals. Um, but you also saw that business travel suddenly completely changed. Mm -hmm. yeah? and, uh, and I don't know about you, I actually quite liked it. Then I'm like, oh my God, it's actually quite nice not always having to travel. And, um, and I do think, for example, that, that business travel still is kind of catching up where consumers already are. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, travel plays in the conscious memory of people. So, um, and that's the reason also in inflationary times that people still spend a lot of time on travel. 12% of everything you experience in your life, you can remember consciously. I don't know if you know that. So I hope I'm in that 12%, you know, like today, but I doubt it. Because what is in your 12%? That's probably your wedding. That's probably that nice trip to Paris. That's a beautiful weekend away in Berlin. So I do think that revenge travel was really a thing because a lot of people said, I need to get out. I want to experience the world. And it's like me going to a beautiful cake shop in, in Berlin yesterday for lunch where they have these beautiful cakes. And I say, oh my God, I love it. You know, and, and you really see something different. So long-winded answer, I do think that consumers have caught up. I see a lot of normality again in the, in the market. Um, people are still very keen to travel. Um, I do think that things have become more expensive. I don't know how that feels for all of you, you know, that, that you look at things like, wow, you know, like even agree. Berlin. Yes, like, oh, absolutely. Oh, yep. So, oh, uh, a glass of wine, hmm, 12 euros, yeah. oh, okay. That's, that's uh, steep, but you still want to experience that. So I would say revenge travel is a bit over. I think we're back again to a pattern of normality. I do think that business is still covering, although that said, I don't know how it felt for you coming here, like, oh my God, a lot of people. Huh? You know, big conferences are back. Yeah, and that's a good thing, I think. Huh? No, absolutely. We love to meet each other, right? And, and just a little follow-up question. Do you think there is still a distinction between business and leisure travel? Or would you say, I mean, there's a lot of talk about pleasure as well, right? Where they say they combine it. Is that something you're seeing at Booking as well? Yeah, I do think that that also has changed. That, um, And I don't know how it is uh, at, at your companies, but at, at Booking, we more or less have a hybrid working situation. Huh? So mm -hmm. we encourage people to be two days a week at the office, and the rest, they just have to figure that out. Also, we allow people to be a month abroad. Uh, and, and people always ask me, why is it not longer? But it gets really complex with taxes and all that kind of stuff. So a month is kind of the, the holy grail. Um, so clearly, it's easy now to go somewhere nice and work for a couple of days. And, exactly. uh, and I do think that that really has changed also how people look at, at uh, business travel. Um, but I do think also, I used to travel sometimes for a meeting of two hours. Yeah, we don't uh, do and, that anymore. And, and I'm like, you know what? I will go on a Zoom call. It's okay. But that's a good uh, thing, though, because I mean, in terms of sustainability as well, efficiency, resources. I absolutely. Think, right? uh, yeah. no, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and we looked at it in, in our company, and our business travel also really is still 50% lower than pre-corona. Uh, right. Because so people still. have a very different mindset and, uh, in, in, in traveling. Yeah, well, but still good is, is optimism there, right? So people want to travel and business travel is still a thing. So yeah. it's not gone away. So, well, you are an experienced marketing leader, right? You've been with Google before and now with Booking. Yeah. So it's, I mean, that must be fantastic working with brands like that. Um, so I have a, um, a very tech, like a question related to marketing because we, there's a lot of talk about performance versus brand marketing, right? And there's a lot of companies, they keep that separate. And then I was very, I find it very interesting when I looked it up, um, your journey at Booking. Yeah. You joined them in 2019 and one of the very first actions you came in and you said okay we take these separate budgets and yeah. we merge them this is one thing so yeah. we don't separate between 
brand and performance marketing. How come? Like, yeah, so, um, listen, I think uh, that it's a misnomer, you know, it's a wrong language because every marketing needs to be performant. No, like when you spend money, you want to see your return. So why would you want to differentiate between brand marketing and, and performance marketing, I, I didn't like that at all. And um, I'm always preparing with my boss and our CFO our earnings call uh, so that they read up uh, the good stuff about our company and the numbers and we would split it out. And I said, let's not do that anymore. And um, because I really believe that it should not matter uh, where you spend money, there should be a return. Clearly, when we do our big Super Bowl ad, it doesn't translate in immediate business. We really are, are acutely aware of that. But it should translate in business within a year. Within yeah, a because year? Because otherwise, oh yeah, otherwise, Absolutely. you know, like, why would we spend all that money? You know, that, that's not what we should be doing. Clearly, the key objective is to make a foundation of awareness and consideration. And I'm actually very proud that, you know, in Germany, we're a household name, but in the, U in the US, we were kind of a distant brand. We're now kind of really up there. Huh? One, out, one out of three Americans can spontaneously cite uh, booking.com. Uh, so that's fantastic. Uh, that's so, absolutely, uh, yeah. that's, that's impressive. And yeah. I mean, that, that that's a good segue to the next question because that's what I find really impressing and I wonder how that works in terms of marketing. Booking.com clearly is a uh, master in being everything to everyone. It's uh, yeah. as opposed to boutique players, for example, right? So everyone can book on your platform. Everyone can look for properties with you. So, and given you have 45 plus languages, it's uh, 147,000 destinations yeah. that you serve. 200 countries. Yeah. It's, it's, the numbers are just, yeah. if you think about it, it's, it's yeah. really massive. So how do you tackle this challenge of being a global brand, but then you need local relevance? Yeah. Well, I can talk to, about this forever, you know, because I have some nice experiences that um, really have taught me that clearly there are differences, but certain things are the same. And when you think about a romantic dinner, um, uh, each of you will be from a different country, probably a romantic dinner in Japan, America, Russia, and Germany have very similar concepts, which it generally involves two people. No, a romantic dinner, two people. It generally involves a table. It generally involves food. There's not loud music. There's kind of calm, quiet, because it's a romantic dinner. And, um, and the key thing is, and I'm not sure how many of you work internationally, is that I would focus on the similarities and then clearly make sure you're locally relevant because the food in Japan is different than it would be in the US. But the concept is actually very, very similar. And, um, and I once advised the big car company, I'm not going to say which one, uh, who had more than 200 different advertising agencies. Wow. And, um, and then all the countries were saying, no, Germany is very different to Italy. And then I made a little edit of all the commercials of that, that, um, that company. And then guess what? You saw a couple in a car on a windy road and it didn't really matter if you were in Italy, Germany or Korea. And so the concept was very similar. So you can actually roll something out very globally. Uh, but you, you change it. I don't know if you know, last year we had a campaign with Melissa McCarthy, um, that campaign we run in Germany, for example, in France, with the German voice of Melissa McCarthy. Everyone knows her from the movies, not a problem whatsoever. So it wasn't as if we had to get a German actress to be relevant in the, in the German market. Yeah, yeah and it's a, it's a way probably also to get share of heart, right? Like to add some emotion to it because yeah. people have a familiar association then. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Is there another campaign you could say is one of your, is one of a very good memory of yours where you said it was a success. That's where we very successfully launched. Yeah, so being relevant we locally. really deeply care about localization. And, um, and I think in the world of technology, it's really important when you are in the US or you are, you are in Germany that your zip code works and everything works just perfectly. I think that's kind of uh, really key. But you really have to be careful for the comment of, oh, in Italy, it's very different. And I'm like, hmm, no, maybe about food, by the way. I don't know how many of you agree. Supposedly, food is pleasure in, in, in Southern Europe and it's fuel in Northern Europe. So there, there are distinct differences. But if you look at the world, you know, um, probably 30 years ago in Berlin, could you really get great food? Mm, uh, maybe not, but now, probably everything you would want yeah. is here. Huh? So, yeah. um, so I do think that the world is converging in some areas. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and another example I maybe take from my Unilever days, that Magnum Classic, you guys all know it, you know, the ice cream on a stick. 
we used to have 26 vanilla flavors. So the German vanilla flavor was different to the Belgium and different to the French one. And I can assure you that the marketing managers of each of those countries would fight each other like it's the third world war. Like, no, mine is different. And then of course, 26 doesn't make sense. You know, there may be four. And so what we did is that we, we gave countries the choice of you have to choose one out of four uh, flavors. So, um, so I do think you need to be very careful with, oh, Germany is different. Because I would argue in the world of technology, you know, lots of similarities. Huh? I find that very interesting very, uh, to think about because I think yeah. I hear that a lot. I hear many people say, no, that's different because that market is very, very different. Yeah, you make a point there. Yeah. yeah. Food for thought. Then um, you mentioned it in your keynote. Um, you talked about purpose and you talked about um, also how Booking.com is um, yeah, engaged there. And I mean, it's, it's something that we see all over the industry, in all industries. There's a heightened awareness and, ex and also expectations as well from, from employees as from customers to towards um, companies and corporations being purposeful yeah. and also positioning towards diversity, equity, inclusion, yeah. for example. So maybe we stick with that topic or LGBTQ as well, right? Yeah. So you mentioned the pride. Um, and something um, I think many of us, we are always wondering, how can you do that authentically? And you said truthfully as is an important keyword. T tell us, how can we avoid the risk of hijacking it for PR and marketing reasons, yeah. doing it really honestly, holistically right. Yeah. And listen, there are many case studies. I don't know, many of you will know the Bud Light story now in the US. Uh, I think that was kind of widely uh, communicated, uh, that they had a transgender influencer and then they got canceled. And then I think Bud Light was sold far less and their share price went down. And there are many case studies in the industry. I think Adidas had a, had a huge issue. Um, so the key thing for me is always, as a brand, like Booking.com, that we go back to our mission and, and we really say, you know, what do we do? Oh, we're a brand for everyone. So it means that there's no asterisk that says, we're not a brand for Chinese people or uh, we're not a brand for people on a budget. No, we are a brand for people on a budget. We're also a brand for people with a big budget. And the moment you go for everyone, you really, especially for example, also in the US, is that we're not a brand for only Republicans, we're not a brand for Democrats. So, so that is a filter that I, I use very much, that we are a unifying you know, force in the industry instead of a polarizing. And I do think that brands sometimes get it wrong too because they want to cut through. No one is paying attention to advertising anymore, so you need to be loud and you need to cut through. But we want to unify. Huh? We don't want to increase polarization. So that's kind of my, my filter. That said, diversity and inclusion, you know, really important. We, we um, have already done for years lots of work in the LGBTQ plus uh, space. I'm a gay man myself, you know, so uh, we introduced Travel Proud, you know, which was, uh, which I was very proud of. And by the way, Berlin was one of the number one, you know, Travel Proud certified um, uh, 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 cities. And Travel Proud came really from the idea is that you want to be treated well when you stand at reception. And it means that if two men are at a reception, you should not necessarily draw the conclusion that they need separate beds or they need a joint bed. You probably just want to look in the booking what has been uh, uh, said. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we're also looking at accessibility um, and, and what we could do there. Supposedly also at a hotel reception, what often happens with people in a wheelchair, that uh, the reception is talk to the person pushing the wheelchair, not to the person in the wheelchair. You know, those are kind of insights that are very easy to teach, yeah, that the industry as a whole can really benefit from. They say, hey, you know, you probably didn't realize there's no bad intent. Yeah, I don't, don't generally think that in 95% of the cases there's no bad intent, but do not assume when two men check into a room that they necessarily want to sleep with each other. Uh, yes. So, um, or the other way around. So, so those are kind of simple uh, uh, ways of working that we give training on, that people are really like, wow, I didn't realize that. And, uh, and it's something we really feel is important because we are a brand for everyone. So it means that, you know, no one should be excluded. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that sounds very good. And it's interesting because it shows also the potential because if it's just about education or information training, exactly, you can see the potential, how 
good we can get at it, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's that's good. And then, um, well, I mean, you're a leader yourself, right? And you have large teams, I assume. And then we, we, we went through a phase of a lot of uncertainty. I think uncertainty will stay with us for quite a bit if you look at the geopolitical situation and everything. What, what, what tips can you share in terms of leadership? I mean, we have so many young talent as well attending ITB. We have other leaders. And it, it's always very inspiring to hear. What's your yeah. best leadership? How do you approach leadership yourself? Yeah, so the, the, the key thing for me is um, don't take yourself too seriously, but take your business seriously. Uh, so no matter, you know, how difficult the business challenge is, you know, just have a bit of fun. You know, like, like acknowledge each other as human beings. And during the corona pandemic, people asked me, oh my God, you know, I just moved from Google. I spent 11 years in Silicon Valley and I just moved to, to booking. And six months later, more or less, the world was falling. Uh, so suddenly, like, oops. There is no travel. People say, oh my God, that must have been really, really difficult. And I said, sure it was, but I had a great team. We actually had a really good time. You know, we had kind of some amazing experiences that otherwise we would never had. Um, and we really were clear about the business challenge that we're like, you know what, we need to dial down on marketing, we need to save costs, we need to, you know, tighten the belt and we'll be ready for the future. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I think is really, really important. Um, another thing that, um, I really uh, care about is grit. Uh, they call it grit, I think. And um, and you guys will probably all hear these things and each of you will have an opinion on it's okay not to be okay. I don't know what you think of it. I have an opinion, I won't share it with you. Um, but at work, it's okay not to be okay, but maybe you should go home. You know, just go home when you don't feel completely yourself. I've been in bad meetings and I'm like, oh my God, you know, I'm so done for the day. And you just leave. And then you go to bed and the next day, you're at it again. And I think that's really important that you have that attitude of, you know what, it's fine to step away a little bit, take a bit of a, a step back, and then the next day you go for it again. Huh? And, uh, and that's uh, kind of interesting. Huh? Right. And allow me another question, because you said it yourself, right? you're, you're a gay man yourself yeah. in, in this community. Is there any advice you have for, for a leader? that wants to be a good role model, because I mean, it, that applies as well to, we talk about female leadership, we talk yeah. about cultural diversity, etc. But you're being a role model there. Is there any learnings you can share there? How to... Yeah, so I, I've been, I've become, I've come full circle. Huh? So I do think actually the term bringing your full self to work is a, um, is a good one. No, like I do think that when you're friends with people at work, I'm here with my whole team and uh, I went, went out with my executive business partner for two nights in a row and it's a pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure, it's fun. We're having a good time, we're friends, you know. So I do think if you don't bring your full self to work, it's actually very difficult to be friends at work. And the seven questions, again, that predict if you're happy at work. You know, um, one of the most important ones is, do you like your boss? When you have a bad boss, you probably don't like your job. Another one is, do you have a best friend at work? And, um, and for each of you, probably, when you think back at the most positive work experiences, it's probably that you had really nice friends at work and that you can laugh together. Or when you have a bad day, you're like, oh my God. This is terrible. It's a safe uh, space then you have a, in a way, right? Exactly. And, um, but that said, I also respect very much is that there is a thing as um, uh, personal life and, 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 and business life. Uh, I've worked a lot in Hamburg in, in Germany. And the big difference was always that you had to be uh, uh, per si. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yes, very formal. Not, not per du. Hey, mm -hmm. The two ways of addressing people in, in German. I do think that's changing now too, also, that, that people are much more kind of per du. Uh, but those were the days, and and I've there was it wasn't that bad actually. You know, people were just very clear. This is work, and this is my private space. So I do think that each of us probably has to choose what you want to do. I do think though that work is work. You know, and and um, you probably want to show up in 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 a good way with a great attitude. Huh? And uh, and then when things are a little bit too much, you know, you probably want to work from home, uh, or you want to say, you know what, I take a day off. Huh? So. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a, yeah, very interesting. And, well, we're almost out of time, but I want to take the chance. Um, are you up for some rapid-fire questions? Oh, of course. Yes, yeah. you are? Okay, let me start. So, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Yeah, uh, I got a, I've worked with fantastic people. One, one great piece of advice that, that I use a lot is that when you go through your calendar, yeah, and you look at appointments in your, in your... Who are the people who give you a smile on your face and who are the people who are like, eh, yeah? And then when you think about it, is that if you show up in someone's calendar, are you a, ah, 
nice or are you oh you know and um and one piece of advice i got is that make sure you're the person that people say ah i have a meeting with this person this will be fun I love you know that. i look forward and um and that's a important realization that because we're all busy, we're all very focused on our business. And sometimes when you run into a meeting, you immediately start with what you want to discuss in, instead of you know, checking Connecting. in with the person and say, hey, how are you, what's on your mind? And how can I help you? And I do think that's really important advice and, and think that through. Uh, and because we all know how it feels when it's a Monday morning, 9 a.m. and you have a terrible meeting. You're like, oh, oh, I have a coffee, you know, and, uh, and you don't want to be that person. So that's, that's a that's good piece of advice. That's very good advice. Well, yeah. I, I noted it down. I'll take that home. And then another one. Um, we talk about trends a lot, but tell me about one trend that you wish would disappear for forever that you're seeing. Is there oh, one you say I have another? Can I say that? Um, <laughs> um, uh, I'm not big on tattoos. I think that's going completely crazy nowadays. You know, like, I don't know. You cannot look at entertainers anymore and they're like completely covered up. I'm like, dude, how will you look in 20 years? This will be terrible. So anyone who is in the industry of tattoo removal, I think that will be a very good uh, uh, business uh, opportunity. Yeah? Well, I think of that if you're soon up for investing, I'll give you a call if there's a, uh, exactly. <laughs> if there's a tattoo business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And is there one thing that you had to learn the hard way? Yeah, so I do think um, the, the key thing, the thing I probably was most difficult is that when you work, I worked in the Silicon Valley with, with you know, very smart people, but very eccentric sometimes and sometimes very removed from a reality. And, uh, and these were the days that people still would shout at work. I don't know if you remember that, you know, like 10, 20 years ago, young people, you could be shouted at. Huh? So um, this is how it was. And, uh, and the key learning for me was, how do you really take people out of that? Huh? So when someone is shouting at you, what do you do? Huh? You can be a victim and you can really say, oh my God, this is really bad. Or you say, this is clearly not a good moment to discuss this. Shall we talk another time? And then generally speaking, I've learned when you do that, that people will calm down huh? because they know they're misbehaving. Huh? They know they're not right. And I do think that the world too much is now kind of in two camps, which is you're either a suppressor or you're a victim. And I think you have to really learn to stand up for yourself in a positive way. Um, and also, I don't know about you, that, that um, uh, I, w I was in a meeting and, and someone um, was constantly on, on their phone. And then, and then I'm like, you know what, do you need five minutes to, uh, to finish your, your business? And then we can continue our conversation. And you will see that people generally, boom, like, oh, no, no, so sorry. So, okay. That's fine, but let's be focused on what we're discussing. So, so that's a, a good piece of advice for, for each of you is that, you know, how do you learn to do that in a, in a non-disruptive way uh, and with a smile on your face? And people will see you're serious. Without being intimidating, actually. So it's, yeah, it's a very good advice. Exactly. I like that. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And not easy, not easy. Huh? Because what sometimes oh. the reaction when someone shouts at you, you can be like, oh, my God, what's happening? And am I doing something wrong? No, you're not doing anything But wrong. isn't it that the most things that sound easy are the hardest to do? Are the hardest, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Huh? Yeah. No, okay, thank you for sharing that. And then, of course, as we had it at the beginning, I have to close with that. What's your favorite restaurant in Amsterdam? My favorite restaurant? Oh, my God, uh, too many, you know, so... Oh, I want to uh, have a list. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I love Indonesian cuisine. Uh, the Netherlands has a lot of very good, uh, you will know from your days yes, in The Hague. I do. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a small neighborhood restaurant that I uh, order a rice table. They call it rice table. And rice it's delicious. Table. I can recommend it to any of you when you're ever in Amsterdam. So that's, good. and it's a super experience as well. Yeah, exactly. So it's not only the food. Yeah. Well, we are out of time. It's a shame because I could continue for forever. Um, where's your booth? It's in Hall 9, is that right? The booking.com booth? Sorry? The, the team is in Hall 9, is that right? Yes, yeah. 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 So everyone make so sure to meet the team. Um, yeah, there's happy the hour at 5. Uh, at five? Oh, I, the you happy have to hour. be invited, I think, so uh, I'll, I'll completely <laughs> share. <laughs> but yeah. please pass by and look at the happy hour from the outside, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that, no uh -huh. we're not doing that. So everyone, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much yeah. for coming in. Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at booking.com, Ian Dyke. Thank you so much. And I say back to Katie. Thank you.